Good afternoon to all of you. Glad to be with you on May 30th. It is sunny and I'm hopeful that all of you enjoyed your Memorial Day weekends and of course uh, took that moment to reflect on why we have the holiday. It's really terrific to be with all of you again and if Kathy you'd advance to the next slide I'll walk you through what we intend to cover as a group today. So I'll begin by addressing some activities in New York State, both in terms of policy and legislation. I'll touch briefly on a bit of uh, what's happening in New York City, where I'm uh, presently standing right now, looking out at Midtown to my left. Um, Kate McClung will be with us in a moment, and she will uh, discuss common overtime mistakes uh, through the vantage point of her experience as a labor and employment attorney back on the webinar. And Kate, thank you for taking the time. Um, and then Emily Fallon will be uh, with us. She is an associate trainee um, who I'll be supervising for the purposes of her presentation. But please trust uh, Emily has uh, a lot to share uh, around this complicated issue that we're just going to uh, provide some broad brushstrokes on specifically concerning housing asylees in New York State, where there's some interesting implications uh, for the bond community. Mark Beloborodov is back with us, um, an intellectual property attorney uh, with our firm who's been keeping us apprised on the activities of the Supreme Court um, concerning intellectual property, and Mark will be here with a recap. Kevin Cope is also back with us on the program, um, and he'll be looking at uh, New York State's uh, glimpse it to, into, excuse me, a uh, ban of non-compete agreements in the wake of the FTC federal proposal on the same. So with that, we've walked through the agenda in terms of what we who intend to cover, excuse me, today. And if Kathy, you'd go to the next slide, I can tell you a little bit again about what's happening here in New York. So with the state legislation, uh, a legislature, excuse me, and the legislative session, uh, set to wrap up on or about the 8th of June, we are getting into that final stretch where there's a lot of scurrying about, as we've talked about before, with the budget being um, a little bit more than a month late, it really truncated the legislative process that typically comes after the budget, but before the summer. Um, so there are a few things that may move through, probably not with the volume that we've seen in years past. Data privacy is a place that we're looking at because there's uh, language moving through the legislature um, that is akin to what we've seen in certain respects in other states where there have been echoes of data privacy legislation. Uh, there may be something uh, that's formalized here in New York after several years of moving things along, but actually not getting to a bill that gets to the governor's desk. So we'll watch that. Um, we may see speed limit reductions in New York City. There's a lot of concern, you know, particularly in the context of the pandemic, that um, there's still issues with uh, safety and the speed of cars. Uh, so that might be something that the legislature opines on. The Clean Slate Act is also um, very much up for discussion. There are bills in both the Assembly and the Senate that would essentially um, take away um, reference to a uh, justice involvement uh, regarding a felony uh, seven years after completion of a sentence and three years after a misdemeanor. Lots of interesting implications for the workplace and for the workforce, so we'll be tracking that too. Next slide, please. And COVID sick leave. We get questions about this every webinar, very reasonably from all of you. Uh, it remains on the books. Nothing has changed. It is something that you know we know is uh, codified in New York State, but there's a bill um, that has been proffered that would roll it back. Again, nothing has happened as of yet and everything is as it was, but um, in the context of our pandemic, uh, thank goodness, ebbing a bit, uh, there's a look to, uh, at least through legislation, to change the standards. And that would essentially um, put COVID sick leave more or less in keeping with other types of sick leave. I'm speaking very broadly, of course. And then if this bill were to uh, come to pass, um, there would be uh, essentially following a period where the legislature would have to, I'm sorry, the uh, New York State Department of Labor and uh, New York State Department of Health uh, issuing a report. Um, if the legislature doesn't act on that report, eventually uh, within 60 days of receipt of the report, the law would come off the books and be entirely um, essentially expunged. And so um, nothing here again has happened, but we're tracking it because we know it's an issue all of you care about. Next slide, please. 
And then the healthcare vaccination requirement. This is another pandemic relating shift. New York State's Department of Health issued a dear administrative letter on November, I'm sorry, on May 24th of 2023, uh, which essentially as of the issuance of that DAL as they're called, um, halted the enforcement of the vaccination requirement. This has a clear connection to the staffing uh, crunch under which New York State continues to function in the healthcare space. Um, it also is another acknowledgement of the fact that we are in a different stage of our pandemic. And this would require FIPIC approval to be formalized. Um, recall this goes back to 2021. First, there was executive order, and then uh, this was all formalized thereafter. Um, and what we're looking at is uh, also a simultaneous extension by Governor Hochul of the executive order concerning the staffing emergency, which runs until June 8th coincident to the end of that legislature and the session that I mentioned. So we'll see if anything gets done in terms of legislation that might um, you know, affect this. There are various uh, elements that might be moving through, um, nothing so solid as yet to report out to all of you. Um, next slide, please. And then finally, um, all of you in the uh, webinar a week ago would have heard from uh, Lisa Feldman, a colleague of mine who spoke about a bill that uh, would prohibit discrimination on the basis of a person's height or weight in employment, housing, and public accommodations in the city. Um, it turns out that subsequent to uh, Lisa's remarks, Mayor Adams here in New York City signed the bill into law, which goes to into effect, excuse me, on November 22nd of 2023. We'll be tracking this. It's again city legislation that is now uh, law in New York, but there may be ripple effects across the state. With that, next, let me take the time to introduce an important contributor to this webinar who's back. Um, Kate is a labor and employment attorney who counsels employers widely on issues including wage, performance, discrimination, and harassment employee absences, and much more. Um, and so we are delighted that um, we can talk a bit about overtime and some of the pitfalls in terms of how one calculates it as an employer or otherwise uh, contemplates it. Kate's with us from Rochester, and thank you once more for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about a few common overtime mistakes that I see come up with clients. Uh, the first is the difference between regular rate and hourly rate. Some employers mistakenly think, oh, overtime is just time and a half the hourly rate. That's easy. But that's not quite right. You have to calculate time and a half the regular rate which is all remuneration except for a very narrow list of exclusions. And some things that I see employers commonly forget to include in their overtime calculations are non-discretionary bonuses, commissions, shift differentials, and tip credits. So with tip credits, for example, if you're paying an employee $12 an hour and taking a $2 an hour tip credit, you have to include that $2 an hour, even though you're not actually paying it, in your overtime calculations. Shift differentials, you include those as well. Uh, commissions and bonuses can be a bit trickier because those are, aren't always paid on a weekly basis. So how do you calculate those? And I'm gonna cover that in just a second. Next slide. So before I turn to how you calculate overtime based on payments such as bonuses and commissions that don't necessarily occur on a weekly basis, I'm going to explain which bonuses need to be included in your overtime calculation because it's only non-discretionary bonuses. Now, most bonuses are non-discretionary, uh, so be very careful about excluding any bonuses from your regular rate. But a if it is pursuant to a contract uh, or then it's non-discretionary. If shortly before the payment, the employer chooses whether or not payment is made and determines the amount of the payment and it's not pursuant to a contract, it's possible that it may be discretionary and doesn't have to be included. But I, because discretionary bonuses is such a narrow uh, term, I would definitely seek some legal advice before excluding any bonuses from your overtime calculations. Next slide, please. So going back to my question of, OK, well, if a bonus and commission is paid for a multi-week period, how do you calculate overtime? I'm going to give you an example of how to do that. So ABC Company hires Wendy Worker for a non-exempt position, 
In her employment contract, ABC promises a $6,000 bonus if she stays there for at least six months. So it's pursuant to a contract. There's no discretion close in time to payment about whether or not to pay and how much to pay. So this is pretty clearly a non-discretionary bonus and it does need to be included in the regular rate. Next slide. So as far as how to pay it, first you have to figure out how to allocate it among the work weeks. It's for a six month period uh, and it's based on just staying there. So you here you would just divide it evenly between those work weeks. But in some circumstances, it may not be evenly worked earned among those work weeks. Let's say it's an attendance-based bonus or bonus for selling every, every widget that you sell. You know, then you would break it up proportionately based on how many widgets you sell on each work week. But here it's spread evenly. So we're going to divide it evenly over that six-week period. Next slide. So if we divide the 6,000 by the 26 weeks in the six month period, we get $230.77 per week. And then you need to go back for each work week and separately calculate how much that extra bonus payment increases the overtime premium. And I've included an example in the slide as far as how, how to do that uh, for a 50 hour work week, for example. But it's important to recognize that you have to do this calculation separately for each and every work week, figure out, out how much it increases the regular rate by dividing it by the total hours worked for the week, multiplying that times half for the overtime premium, and then multiply that by the overtime hours. Next slide. Okay. Mistake number two involves missing hours worked. And we see a lot of litigation where employees are claiming that they worked off the clock and didn't get paid overtime as a result. And there's different theories for how this might work, that they missed meal periods. Some of you may use automatic deduction policies where you automatically deduct 30 minutes a day for lunch, which is completely legal, but you need to make sure you have a system in place where employees can report if they missed any of that time and actually worked during their meal period. Uh, rest breaks of 20 minutes or less have to be paid. Uh, so if you're deducting those from the pay, that could lead to an overtime claim or a minimum wage claim. Small periods of remote work. We've seen an increasing number of these types of claims over the pandemic, where employees are responding to emails after hours or little phone calls here and there, not tracking that time. There's also compensable on-call time or waiting time where employees aren't engaging in productive work but there's restrictions on that time, either the length or where they have to be present. That, that means that they can't effectively use that time for their own purposes. It's possible that time might have to be compensated. And if so, you'd wanna make sure that you are capturing that time. Uh, this is a very fact dependent issue. So it really depends on the specific circumstances as far as whether or not it has to be compensated and tracked. Uh, compensable training time, uh, training time is compensable uh, unless four different factors are all met. So if the training, attendance at the training is voluntary, if it's outside the employee's working hours, if it's not related to the employee's job, and if the employee didn't perform any productive work at the training, all four of those factors are met. It, you don't have to compensate for it. But the vast majority of training time is compensable, has to be tracked, has to be counted towards overtime hours. Uh, compensable travel time. Uh, my colleague covered the rules for compensable travel time a few weeks ago, so I'm not going to repeat those there. But these are the common types of missing hours worked claims that we see. Next slide. Okay, unauthorized overtime. So some companies have policies that say you may not work overtime without advance authorization from your supervisor, and it's legal to have those policies, but if an employee violates that policy and works overtime without authorization, and you're aware or should be aware that they did that, you still have to pay them for the time. You can discipline them for violating the policy, uh, but you have to pay for the time. Hours worked have to be paid, have to be counted towards that overtime calculation. Uh, just a few questions in the Q&A before I toss it back to my colleagues. Uh, one of you asked, the extra bonus isn't guaranteed, so why is it included? They might not earn it. 
Again, once they do earn it after that six months and it's paid, that's the point at which you have to include it in the overtime calculation. So it is a retroactive calculation. Um, someone asked about year end bonuses based on company performance. Uh, what about those? Uh, sometimes those can be uh, non discretionary as well. So, again, discretionary versus non discretionary, very fact dependent. Always a good idea to seek legal advice before excluding a bonus payment from your overtime calculations. Thank you all. And thank you, Kate. That was very informative. And I know that all those questions that come through the chat are indicative of the kind of interest your presentation has generated. And so looking forward, of course, uh, to, as you can, answering uh, those questions on our uh, on behalf, excuse me, of those who are uh, tuning in today. And of course, you're welcome back at any point for another quiz, uh, if you so wish to deliver one. Um, and in the meanwhile, let me now uh, shift to our next speaker, who's Emily Fallon. Emily is an associate trainee uh, based in our uh, office in Garden City. And um, Emily has done um, a significant amount of research um, to look at some of the broad issues. Again, we're taking this from the very top level at this point um, concerning the uh, challenges that we're seeing in New York, uh, both in the downstate as well across the state um, around uh, asylees who are uh, entering the United States um, in significant volume. And we recognize this as a set of issues um, that, uh, A, we're not going to opine on politically. Again, we're just uh, you know, sharing information today. But B, that may very well have implications for a number of different um, bond clients who are tuning in today. So we want to touch on some of those broad brush strokes, and uh, I'm supervising Emily's uh, presentation today. Emily, though, the floor is yours, and we look forward to learning from you. Thank you so much for being with us. Absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again, Gabe, for the introduction. I'll, today, I'll be speaking with you, as Gabe mentioned, about the developing state of housing asylees in New York. If you, Kathy, you could please do the next slide. So by way of background, as many of you have heard across news outlets, there has been an increasing number of migrants across the entirety of New York State. And important in this conversation is the distinction between someone who is considered a refugee or an asylee and what the difference in that classification means with regards to their status within the United States. So someone with refugee status is an individual who applies for United States protection while they are still in their home native country. So this would be an individual that waits to travel to the United States upon approval of their legal refugee status. And in contrast, someone with asylee status migrates to the United States and crosses into the country and then applies for legal status and protections and may then later be granted asylum protections. Next slide, please. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, the Trump administration implemented a travel restriction commonly known as Title 42. Title 42 previously was rarely used, um, which was a clause in the 1944 Public Health and Services Law that addresses public health, social welfare, and civil rights. And as was relevant during the COVID-19 era, Title 42 permitted US border authorities to turn unknown migrants away upon arrival on the grounds of preventing the spread of COVID the COVID-19 virus, as we now know, is transmitted via airborne particles. So practically speaking, the intent of implementing Title 42 at this time was to secure the United States borders in an attempt to isolate the spread of COVID-19. As such, this complicated the process for those who would seek to enter the United States and subsequently seek asylum because Title 42 created the opportunity to be turned away before any legal process to obtain asylum status could begin. So when Title 42 was in effect, we noticed a drop in asylum seekers because U.S. Border Patrol had the authority to turn migrants away upon arrival. However, as is relevant to today's presentation, the Biden administration ended the COVID-19 public health emergency on May 11, 2023, subsequently terminating Title 42 authority, which, as I stated, had been continuing to impede the asylum seeking process. Next slide. As such, across the country, there has been an increase in migrants coming to the United States and seeking asylum. In particular, New York State has experienced a sizable increase in migrants with nearly 41,000 migrants in New York City alone. Currently, these migrants 
predominantly being housed in hotels across the city, which is currently being paid at the city of New York's expense. Mayor Eric Adams has taken the position publicly that the city is currently at capacity and cannot adequately house or maintain any more increase in migrants that arrive to the city. So in response to this increased number in migrants, Mayor Adams announced a relocation plan in which the city would organize for migrants to be bused to various counties across the state and would then be provided housing and shelter in hotels again at the city's expense. Next slide. There was and continues to be a mixed and complex response to Mayor Adams' relocation plan and what it means to be one of the counties that would be affected by the plan, meaning being the location where the migrants currently in New York would be relocated to. Of the 57 counties outside of New York City, 36 counties and two towns have declared states of emergencies. The specific nuances of declaring an emergency varies from place to place. However, the practical effect across the board is that the states of emergency enjoins hotels and other short-term residence facilities within their respective perimeters from being used as migrant shelters. So for example, Rockland County requires that the county approve and issue a license to a hotel before that hotel um, can provide migrant housing as a part of the relocation plan. If such a license is issued, it is only valid for up to 15 days, and the city must provide assurances in advance that the housing fees will be paid in full. Further, if any hotel operates um, without such license, they will be fined over $2,000 a day. So this poses the first secondary question of what happens in Rockland County or a county that imposes a similar cap on the ability for hotels to provide migrant shelter once that cap is reached. So what happens in Rockland County on day 16 once the housing license has expired? Does New York City have any obligation to continue to financially support these migrants that have been relocated and provided housing? And if not, where do they go next? What's the next step of the plan? Similarly, uh, Putnam County recently issued three executive orders, including one that directs hotels, motels, and other facilities that have already obtained uh, temporary residence permits to not accept any more migrants or asylum seekers absent a shared services agreement with the county. So in that instance, there are three parties to a deal, the hotel or residence facility, facility um, the city of New York and Putnam County all have to be involved in negotiating a deal. So these also, this also creates many follow-up questions that continue to be a gray area where there isn't a clear answer. First, for hotels and other short-term residence facilities that would like to participate in the relocation plan. The process for obtaining a housing license from a county that requires one is not clear. And if such license is denied, what would the grounds for a denial be and can such decision be appealed? So judges across the state have issued temporary restraining orders, commonly referred to as TROs, which in effect put a halt to any additional migrants from being relocated. So the answers to these questions remain to be unclear for the time being. Next slide. So this ongoing back and forth with county and municipal executives created an obstacle for hotels and other places of short-term residents who did wish to participate in the relocation plan and provide shelter as an additional stream of income from New York City, because as I mentioned, New York City is paying housing fees for migrants that are relocated. So as a result of the states of emergencies uh, from various counties, hotel owners claim that the deals that they had previously reached with the city to house the migrants have lost effect. Presently, a group of hotel owners filed a federal lawsuit in the Southern District of New York, arguing that the county executives are targeting their businesses and threatening to negatively impact their income for their previous agreements to lodge relocated migrants. First and foremost, this lawsuit challenges the basis of the validity of such executive orders that require uh, the temporary residence licenses in the first place. They further allege that in some counties that did require housing licenses, County executives would intentionally withhold such licenses, effectively interfering with their business contracts with the city, making it nearly impossible for them to pay. Next slide. Recognizing this present conflict, Governor Hochul announced that she is considering offering multiple state university and city university campuses for temporary migrant housing locations in dorm rooms as a possible solution. While she is yet to confirm, 
which campus infrastructure has the capacity to take on this mission, she maintains that the decision will be made based on the number of open and available dorm rooms while not substantially interfering with the day-to-day -day operations of the university. Again, while not confirmed by the governor or governor's office, many news outlets have reported on rumors that the top candidates to take on this project are Stony Brook University on the east end of Long Island, SUNY Buffalo in Western New York, and SUNY Albany in the capital region. Next slide. So in sum, uh, the situation housing the increasing number of asylees across the state continues to develop each and every day. So to note, there are a few specific points and key takeaways that we anticipate to unfold over time. First, New York State has not formally responded to the counties and towns that have declared states of emergencies. There may be possible legal action if the state decides that these places acted outside their authority in imposing states of emergencies and executive orders that did enjoin hotels from providing shelter to the re relocated migrants. As of now, temporary orders stopping further placement of asylum seekers remains in effect until judges decide uh, whether to extend them by issuing longer term orders known as a preliminary injunction. A preliminary injunction would prevent hotels and other short-term residence facilities from taking in asylum seekers while the cases play out until a judge issues a final ruling on the merits of the material legal dispute. Next, we have yet to see any federal action, not just with regards to providing assistance to New York, but to any of the states impacted by the increased number of migrants. We continue to monitor any action taken by the Biden administration that may provide more direction or assistance on how the regions of New York and the various in businesses impacted should operate moving forward. We also continue to monitor Governor Hochul's vetting of the SUNY and CUNY campuses for possible housing, which not only impacts those involved in the higher education space, but also creates possible challenges for municipalities and other organizations with the relevant universities. Uh, thank you all for your time this afternoon. And I would ask that if you have any follow-up questions, please do not hesitate to contact myself, Gabe, or the bond attorney you're most familiar with. Thank you. And I'll send it back over to you. Emily, thank you for that presentation. It was very thorough and gave us a very um, good understanding of the high level um, nature of these issues. We brought it forward though today because we're very familiar with the fact that uh, there may be institutions of higher education tuning in, uh, perhaps those uh, who are involved with hotel franchises. These are just some of the examples of uh, clients that we know that the firm represents. And we recognize that as these issues permeate, there may be ways in which they affect your businesses. And we wanted you to be thinking about them. And uh, as Emily noted, to reach out to the bond attorney with which you have uh, the best working relationship in order to discuss. Um, but for the moment, uh, just note that we'll come back to these issues as they continue to mature. And I'll move to our next speaker with, again, thanks to Emily for her time. Mark Beloborodov is back with us. And Mark is here to present on uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, we've heard from Mark before concerning the Supreme Court and its forays into intellectual property this term. It's a space where typically the court does not uh, spend a lot of time. And so it was notable in and of itself that uh, you know there was activity on the docket. And uh, now we're ready to learn, so what actually has happened at the court and why does it matter as a word to all of you tuning in? We think you'll enjoy learning. Um, Mark, we're really glad that you come back and give us an update. So please go right ahead. And I look forward to learning along with the audience. Great, um, Gabriel, thank you. Thanks for having me back. Uh, indeed, if you were in the audience in the mid-December, um, we talked about uh, two cases that uh, was picked, were picked up by the Supreme Court uh, in the IP arena. One is copyright uh, and the Warhol case. The other is uh, on a patent side. Um, and the uh, Supreme Court um, you know, usually uh, takes up IP issues when there's something that we really want to change uh, or you know, so some other interesting issue for them. And there were some concerns that there might be uh, some changes coming. And spoiler alert, both of these cases you know, did not shatter Earth much, uh, but there were some interesting uh, cover and um, guidance that I will uh, briefly go over. Next slide, please. So the first case, uh, Andy Warhol case, um, just a very uh, brief uh, recap. Uh, Lynn 
Goldsmith is a photographer who over her long career took many um, well-known photographs of musicians and artists, uh, created um, album covers. Um, there she is with Andy Warhol on the right. In 81, she took a photo of young up-and-coming artist named Prince after one of his concerts with him looking young and vulnerable. In 1984, Vanity Fair took a license to this photograph uh, and commissioned uh, Andy Warhol to create a painting out of it, um, which, which he did. And in fact, until, uh, through 1987, Andy Warhol created a series of silk screens that you see on your screen uh, based on these photographs. When Prince died in 2016, they were used uh, for a tribute. Um, and when Goldsmith claimed that until then, she was not aware that her photograph was used and um, Andy Warhol Foundation never provided any attribution to her as a source photographer. So she got upset uh, and ensued. Actually, well, no, we're talking about infringement of her copyright and Andy Warhol Foundation sued her seeking judgment that in fact, the uh, word by Warhol is so different or transformative that in fact, there is no copyright claim. Um, the district court granted sovereign judgment uh, in favor of Andy Warhol Foundation based on uh, fair use defense. We'll talk about it in a second. Uh, and then the Court of Appeals uh, reversed. And so Andy Warhol appealed. Next slide, please. The legal framework is pretty straightforward. Uh, copyright Act gives the copyright owners the right to prepare derivative works, meaning kind of follow up work based on original material. Um, and the defense to someone coming after creating something based on original work is a fair use where uh, it's not an infringement to kind of create these works for criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching. And in looking at each instance, the number one factor on the list here is the purpose and character of such use. And also whether that, that use is of commercial nature. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in the kind of artistic context the only time really this issue came up before was in 94 when a rap group called two life crew created a parody of roy orbison's famous song pretty woman kind of you know making fun of its romanticism and perhaps naivete in a way and the supreme court said you know what parody is okay you know it's you cannot make a parody of something without making clear kind of uh, what you're parodying. And so that is, that's okay. Um, and really this issue never came up since. And everyone knows that it's okay to, you know, pa uh, create parodies, um, obviously using the original work in doing so. Next slide, please. So at the, at their pleadings and then the oral hearing, uh, and the Oral Foundation made this innovative argument that the work by Andy Warhol is so transformational, it, it creates different message, different meaning. Um, and in doing so, it really get, gets to the, up to the level of fair use. And the question was really, is the court even permitted to consider you know, what is you know, meaning the message of the work that closely resembles the original uh, material. And one more time, you can see on your screen, you know, the, the photograph and the still screen used in the uh, tribute to Prince after his death in 2016. Next slide. So kind of cutting to the chase, Supreme Court ruled against in your whole foundation and kind of restated um, the the standard of fair use, that is an objective inquiry and subjective intent, meaning or impression is not really, um, is not really relevant. Um, and so, especially as in, in this case, kind of the secondary use and original work uh, have the same purpose uh, to, to depict 
prints in a in a publication and the, how much transformation actually happened in a subsequent work uh, should be weighed against the commercial um, nature uh, of the use. And, and quote the majority written by Justice Sotomayor, the original words are in, or images entitled to copyright protection even against famous artists like Andy Warhol. So what about the parody? What about the, you know, the Campbell case? You know, they kind of dismiss that as you know, it stands on its own. We didn't create really any kind of a pathway for a particular uh, you know, meaning or message or, or uses that would uh, create you know, other kind of fair use examples. Um, so that's like not much support um, from that case. So interestingly, so here's some color. Uh, Justice Gorsuch wrote a concurring opinion to make a point very specifically that he does not find persuasive the argument that the war by Andy Warhol created this larger than life icon. And in fact, uh, I'm going to quote him. Um, Happily, the law does not require judges to tangle with questions so far beyond our competence. Um, the first fair use factor requiring courts to assess whether the purpose or character of the challenge use is the same as protected use, which Gorsuch believed it, it did. So happily, we don't need to be art experts to understand the difference. Next slide, please. And Justice Kagan took an issue with that. Uh, there's a dissent by her, uh, joined by Justice Roberts, where uh, she actually took an issue with majority thinking of Warhol as just being a modest alteration. Um, knowing, knowing that Warhol is known as a truly, you know, artist who reframed and reformulated uh, the work that he kind of built up on, built up upon. Um, and the decision by the majority kind of uh, takes the breathing room away uh, from uh, from the purpose and character standard of fair use and potentially may still creativity. Um, and she even accused the majority of they even look at the art in question. It was very, very interesting um, dissent that she wrote. So where does it does it bring us? Um, so museum and art foundations, of course, worry now that um, th th there, there is a, a bit of a, you know, uh, less of, of a leeway for something like what Andy Warhol did. On the other hand, creative artists welcome this ruling. And in fact, this is in terms of policy, a decision by the Supreme Court recognizing strong rights of um, content creators. Any questions about this case or you know the cover that I brought? By all means, um, let me know. This is a very in the end interesting discussion that happened um, uh, in, in in the opinion and the dissent and the concurrence. Mark, um, thank you. Thank you so much for keeping uh, us I, all I up just, to speak. If I just, just one, uh, am, I, am I out of time? Please, no, continue. OK, uh, next, next slide, please. So the other case uh, is, is very interesting, but also um, I, I, I should mention that our firm um, had the privilege to actually be part of the Supreme Court case, where we represented um, two law professors who submitted a amicus brief um, in, in this case, um, supporting the position uh, by Sanofi. And this case, now we're switching to the patent side of things. And the issue uh, here is how much an inventor needs to teach the world about their invention to receive the benefit of the, the, the patent monopoly, the exclusion of, of the of patent claims. Um, which is kind of the foundational kind of quid pro quo bargain of the US patent system. Uh, next slide, please. So in this case, Amgen has several federal patents on antibodies used to treat high cholesterol. Um, they have patents on those antibodies claimed structurally, but then also there are a couple of patents where they were claimed functionally, kind of generically according to their function of binding with certain amino acids. Um, the, the inventors in that case identified 26 antibodies and provided some suggestion how others might um, go look for more of those antibodies. Um, 
but that's that's kind of as far as they could go. Amgen sued Sanofi for patent infringement, um, and Sanofi prevailed and the challenge that these patents are invalid because the description, the enabling um, component of the bargain was not met. Uh, CFC affirmed. It went up to the Supreme Court, kind of really, and Jen was just trying to push a little bit of the boundary here, like really uh, how much you need to disclose in order to get broad protection of these kind of functionally defined uh, inventions. Next slide, please. And, you know, like I said, um, the Supreme Court unanimously uh, affirmed the um, uh, Court of Appeals ruled against Amgen and kind of reiterated the rule that you really need to provide enough enabling disclosure to really need to do your part of the bargain and teach the world about your invention. And in this case, Amgen failed to enable what they have claimed. Um, and in fact, all they, they did in their specification to kind of allegedly provide some guidance to the world was not more than a um, research proposal. Uh, and this is just not enough. Um, where does this lead us? Pretty much where we were, uh, except um, extra care need to be taken where your invention is really broad. So we really need as patent attorneys to avoid, you know, what Amgen did, and, and, and try to put in as much uh, teaching of how invention works into the specification, especially when we try to claim the invention broadly, again, as Amgen did. Thank you. Any questions, you know where to find me. Thank you very much, Mark. And we're delighted that you could come and give us this retrospective on the term and the implications. And obviously, for those of you who uh, think of bond in the context of intellectual property questions, um, we are, you know, a firm that certainly does have depth in the space. And uh, Mark is among a group of attorneys, uh, you know, to whom you might wish to turn. Uh, why don't we, uh, speaking of turning, go to our next and final presenter for the afternoon, and that's Kevin Cope, who's with us to talk about non-compete agreements at least being considered and language around that, that is, um, in the context of activity at the federal level by the uh, FTC. This is all just proposed, but it's important to just stay on top of things. And so with that in mind, Kevin, we want to give you a few minutes and thank you so much for coming back to the program in order to brief the group. I should add though uh, that you're with us from Buffalo and uh, we're really glad that you are presenting this afternoon. Please go right ahead. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as most of you are aware, the Federal Trade Commission back on January 5th of 2023 proposed a nationwide ban of non-competes. And to just provide a quick update on that, the comment period for that proposed regulation has closed. However, the FTC has indicated through a recent Bloomberg report that they won't be considering a vote on that until at least 2024 likely April of 2024 per that Bloomberg article. Uh, this is likely due to the volume of comments that they received, which tends to indicate that that proposed, legis that proposed regulation is not going to be instituted in the form that it was originally proposed. We will likely see some amendment, if not significant amendment to it. And I would not be surprised to see if the FTC's proposed regulation ultimately ends up um, curtailing non-compete agreement against low wage income uh, workers as opposed to just all workers generally. Something that you might have missed, though, is that immediately after the FTC in, uh, submitted its proposed regulation, the New York State Assembly and New York State Senate both filed um, identical proposed, uh, proposed bills that would ban non-compete agreements across New York State. The Assembly on uh, January 13th uh, submitted Bill A10278 and the Senate on January 27th submitted Bill S3100, um, both of which uh, proposed to ban non-competes entirely across the state of New York. Uh, the reason why this is probably more of the immediate concern over the FTC ban is because the FTC, as, as I said, is likely not to consider the issue until April of 2024. Um, and here, both of those bills have gained support in the relative labor committees that they've been submitted to. In the assembly uh, on May 22nd, the assembly labor committee took a vote and it passed 19 to nine 
to move to a floor vote. And in the Senate Labor Committee on May 23rd, it passed nine to one to move to a floor vote. While a floor vote has not yet been scheduled, um, we anticipate that there would be a floor vote prior to the um, legislative session ending on June 8th. However, even if that does not occur, uh, it's, it does not prohibit the Assembly or the Senate from taking it up at a floor vote once the, uh, the new legislative session starts. Uh, as to what the bills actually propose, um, it proposes an amendment to the New York Labor Law adding a section 191-D uh, that in, 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 all instances, in all essences bans non-competes across the state. It makes them void as of 30 days following the filing or, or the signing of the bill into law, um, and it prohibits non-competes from being entered into after that. And the statute has a rather large uh, or a rather broad definition of what a non-compete is, as does the FTC um, regulation. And basically under the New York State proposed 191D, a non-compete encompasses anything that would prohibit an employee or hinder an employee from um, obtaining lawful employment following the cessation of their employment. With that broad definition, it brings concerns about whether or not other employer protective measures would be swallowed into this broad definition. So whether or not non-solicitation agreements or um, non-disclosure agreements or confidentiality agreements would be swallowed into the non-competition ban that is proposed in this in this um, in this proposed section 191-D. And the answer to that is we really don't know if it's if it's how broadly it will be read. Section 191-D has a has an express um, statement in there that it's not intended to include non-solicitation agreements or non-disclosure agreements, but also maintains the caveat that if such agreements have the effect of prohibiting the, uh, the prohibiting lawful employment, then they would be considered a non-compete agreement. So, with that said, it, it, it comes to what should employers do in order to prohibit themselves from being in a situation where they either need to rescind contracts or recognize that they can't enforce certain agreements. And the first thing to do is to limit non-compete agreements to only those employees that you have an actual need for a non-compete uh, non-compete agreement with. If it's an employee, if it's a low wage earner who does not who doesn't have access to any important information or important clients or anything like that, we recommend that you don't enter into non-compete non agreements with them because there's little upside to it. At, at this point, it's unlikely that that would be enforced in any event, and it could only present with an opportunity for an employee to say that it's being enforced or it creates an additional need on your part to recognize that it's not being enforced and send out notification to that employee. For those employees that you would want to enter into non-compete agreements with, you want to draw them as narrowly as possible. So both in terms of geographic scope and time period. So if an employee only operates within a 10 mile radius of their current location, limit the non-compete the, 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 the non agreement to that area, limit the non-solicitation agreement to that area. If an employee only has access to a limited amount of documents, limit the non-disclosure agreement to that set of documents. Don't go broader than is necessary because the broader the agreement is, the more likely it's going to be considered a non-compete agreement that is subject to um, this section, this proposed section 191-D. And violation of section 191-D um, can be concerning to employers if this bill actually passes and becomes law because it provides for um, liquidated damages up to $10,000 per employee as well as the employee's actual damages, attorney's fees, and costs. And as most um, employers who have dealt with uh, litigation under the New York labor law know, attorney's fees can become quite concerning in the context of these types of litigation, because if the employee prevails, those attorney's fees can get into the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on how long the, um, the, the litigation um, goes on for. So with that said, um, we are continuing to monitor uh, both the federal ban and the statewide ban. And just as a matter of note, just today, the Office of General Counsel for the National Labor Relations Board issued a memorandum relating to non-compete agreements. So that's something that we're keeping an eye on as well.
Kevin, thank you for the succinct summary of what's happening at the federal and state levels. And even though the federal activity is on a relatively slower track based on what you just reported out, um, we're keeping our eyes on it all. And uh, we thank you for your help with that. And uh, as uh, activity relates to that legislative session I mentioned, which is uh, you know, functionally wrapping up on or about the 8th, um, if there's anything that we see as worthy of reporting back out to you, uh, certainly we'll do that. If Kathy, you could go to the last slide, please. Let me just uh, make sure the group knows where to find all of us who presented today. If there are questions, please email us or otherwise uh, reach out to the bond attorney with whom uh, you have your strongest working relationship. I'll be back with you in two weeks and uh, the webinar itself will be back uh, next Tuesday. We're wishing you all a uh, great rest of uh, what's left of May and I'll see you next month in June. In the meanwhile, have a terrific afternoon.